maybe a few thoughts, you know, uh, first is practice kindness. You know, as we all know, we all have challenges and issues in our lives. And so some of which is known, some of which is not give people the benefit of the doubt and spread a little kindness. It goes a long way. I would say practice gratitude, you know, for as much as maybe some things don't work out our way, there is so much that does. And so really be thankful for those. And then lastly, believe, believe in what's possible. Believe that, you know, you can make a difference. Welcome to At the Heart of It. Welcome to At the Heart of It. I'm Nancy Brown, CEO of the American Heart Association. Women in leadership is one of my favorite topics, and I'm so excited to introduce you to an amazing female executive who is shattering glass ceilings, advocating for women, as well as making a real difference in the financial industry. Shattering glass ceilings and advocating for women and minorities, Yi Xing Hung. CEO of New York Life Investment Management, the highest ranking female operating executive at New York Life, is a force to be reckoned with. Her financial career spans over three decades, dedicating her career to expanding the pool of investors. Yi Shin was part of a large study on how to encourage women to invest. She's received dozens of awards, including Barron's 2020 100 Most Influential Women in U.S. Finance and 25 Most Powerful Women in Finance by American Banker for three years in a row. Yi Shin is a strong advocate for underserved segments of the investment community. And today she'll help us invest in ourselves. Welcome to the show, Yi Shin. Thank you, Nancy. It's so great to be here with you. Yi Shin, I'd like to start by playing an icebreaker that I do with each of my guests. It's my signature five questions. Are you ready to play? I am. Yishin, what is the last TV show you watched or streamed? Oh, let me see. It's been a while. I would say Schitt's Creek. Oh, yes. That, that kept us all laughing. How about the last great meal you had? A uh, lobster dinner. Oh, yum. The last song you listened to? Uh, let me see. I think butter. What is your superpower? Um, connecting the dots. And what was your first job? As um, an investment banker. Oh, wonderful. You started right out uh, in, in a wonderful career. Good for you. Well, you know, today you are recognized as a leader in the finance industry, but when you think back to a younger you growing up and in college, you didn't have many peers who looked like you. From where and whom did you draw inspiration as an Asian American woman? You know, you're right. I did not have a lot of role models to look up to. And, you know, in some ways, this actually served me well. I was inspired, I'd say, by a couple of family members. My dad, in particular, was such an influence in my life. And I respected him so much for his intelligence and his perseverance and hard work and accomplishing what he set out to do. My grandmother on my mother's side was such an accomplished woman. And that was back in China 50 to 70 years ago. But what I found is over the course of my career, I would find different people with attributes that I really admired and wanted to emulate. And so over the course of time, it's been a variety of people that I've looked to that have challenged me and kind of moved me in different directions. So it's a lot of people I'm thankful for. Sounds like you have uh, have have built a wonderful uh, set of mentors over the years. That's really incredible. I've heard you say that you were a quiet and shy undergrad in engineering. So I'd love to know how you found your voice from being that quiet, shy engineering undergrad to a career in finance and to it, one of the very few female CEOs in your field. Well, you know, it was quite a journey. I grew up in an environment where children were seen and not heard. And I was exceptionally good at doing what I was told to do. And so in some ways that has proven to be a very consistent thing over my career 
where I am very goal oriented, focused on the outcome and will put in tremendous amount of hard work and effort to achieve it. But I will say this whole notion of solving a problem, you know, when I was back in school, there was only one right answer and I could work on it by myself. And then over the course of time, it was working with a team of people and bringing folks together with different perspectives, backgrounds and experiences, really to look at a problem from multiple dimensions, recognizing that there is no single right answer. And today, I would say that, you know, I'm in a position now being CEO of my business to create an environment, a culture, and a team where people are doing exactly what I was doing and really bringing lots of folks together to solve those problems. So in some ways, it's different. And in many ways, it's the same. How would you um, describe the similarities or differences between those two worlds? In some ways, if I think about engineering, which is what I studied uh, in college and then in um, finance, you know, these are technical fields. And so there's a lot of analytics that go into that. And so that is common. But what is different is that in our business today, we're really trying to help people realize their financial aspirations, whether that's, you know, sending their children to college or affording that first home or living comfortably in retirement. And so to me, there is a really strong purpose associated with what we're doing. And we're constantly challenging ourselves to think about what more we can do to help people really see through those dreams they have for themselves. I love that vision and that culture that you've created about caring about the people you're helping. That's amazing. And it sounds like as you worked your way through the ranks in business and finance, you really emulated many leadership qualities from other people. What leadership qualities do you admire most in others that you have tried to build into your own leadership? You know, the leaders that really left such an impression on me are those that were really focused on the collective success of all of us and less about themselves. And importantly, you know, I felt that they took a real investment in me and my career, my development. And so those people really stand out for me. And I try in my leadership role today to recognize it's not just about the intellectual pursuit, what strategy we're going to pursue, what's our competitive positioning, but it's as much of really creating an environment where people feel like they belong, that they can bring their whole selves into you know everything that, that we're doing and that their voice really matters. Yeah, that's so important. I think we never quite understand the impact that that philosophy has on people, you know, and how they bring their best selves to work every day. And your legacy really is about opening the door for other women and for others who represent underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. How do we encourage more women, as an example, or more individuals from underrepresented groups to become involved in investing in financial services? You know, we often think of these as the man with the briefcase, you know, jobs for the man with the briefcase. But I look at you and it's just so inspiring what you're doing and how you're leading. Well, you know, so much of what we do in the asset management business is where I am in the wealth management business is really, as I said, helping people to to live their dreams, you know, to be able to take their hard earned savings and really realize, you know, what they want for themselves and their lives. And I think that purpose, you know, sometimes gets a little lost because finance is a very technical arena. There's a lot of acronyms. And so it can be a little off putting. But I think it's really sharing the story of the impact that you can have. You know, a couple years ago at our company in New York Life Investments, we did this study of women investors across this country. And I hosted a series of dinners for very successful women financial advisors. And I used my family members as examples of the different segments of women, like my mother, who was suddenly single when my father passed away and she'd never written a check in her life to my aunt who came here to this country with very little money and became a successful entrepreneur. And I have two sisters, one who's a married breadwinner, the other is a married contributor. And as you can imagine, each of these women have different needs and wants, but you know, underlying all of it was a desire to be more financially educated and financially savvy. And I remember sharing this story and hearing one of the women who was one of these most successful advisors in this country share her story which is that she was one of seven children growing up, had a single mom that held down multiple jobs just to get by. And she vowed that she would get herself in a position where she wouldn't have that same 
challenge in life and that she could be in a position to help not only her mother, but many, many other women. And so it's that that I think we need to bring to the to light because it's not true, of course, of women, but for all groups of people to be able to understand, you know, how do you really achieve what you want for yourself? And I think this profession really gives each of us an opportunity to do that. Yeah, I love that thought of achieving what we want for ourselves and setting out to do something grand. And in a way, that's what our two organizations are doing together. We're doing something grand. And that's through the American Heart Association's Social Impact Fund, where we're supporting local entrepreneurs and organizations that are developing solutions to really critical issues like food insecurity, lack of affordable housing, and access to quality health care and education. You had this vision of partnering with us. Tell us why this is important to you personally, why this is important to your company, and what you hope we'll achieve together. Yeah, you know, we are so delighted to be in partnership with you, Nancy. Um, I think it starts with our two organizations. You know, we've been both around a long time. I think you're about 100 years old. Yeah, pretty soon. Yes. And New York Life just celebrated its 175th anniversary. I know we're both very mission-oriented organizations. I know AHA talks about being a relentless force for longer, healthier lives. And we talk about helping to build a better world for those we love. I mean, at the very core, I think there is the basis for a wonderful partnership. You know, we very much align with, um, you know, the focus of AAJ, which is around education, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. And so we wanted to develop the first of our dual impact products that is oriented around companies that are doing just that. At the same time, being in a position to support your great work that you're doing with the Social Impact Fund. And that's what we mean by dual impact, really advancing companies that are doing good along the lines of, you know, the mission of the American Heart Association at the same time addressing these health inequities that you speak about. Well, I'll tell you what, together we're making a really important difference and we're so proud of our work together. And again, for me, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to work with you and your amazing team. And I really admire how you juggle your role as a CEO. You have a family. You know, how do you find time for self-care? How do you take care of yourself? How do you remember to put yourself at the top of your to-do list? You know, one thing that I do try to do is to focus on that which I can control and let go of all the rest. And I have the priorities in my life. So... You know, obviously I have a big responsibility in the role that I have, and I want to make sure I devote myself to that. But family is also incredibly important to me, too. And so I'm just mindful of where I spend my hours. You know, ultimately, where you spend your time should be lined up with your priorities. And then lastly, I'd say, you know, for all of us, we have to find those activities that rejuvenate us, that re-energize us. And, um, you know, for me, it is you know, things of beauty. Um, you know, I was a dancer uh, when I was younger. It's those kinds of activities that bring me joy, but it could be different things for other people. It could be spirituality or acts of kindness or a sense of adventure. Well, whatever it is, I think we have to make sure that's a part of our lives too. Yeah, those are really wise words. Thank you for sharing those. I know that you have a child with autism. How has this changed your perspective about life? Well, you know, he has been an incredible gift. He is a young man today, age 24, and he was diagnosed at the age of two. And, you know, it was a challenging uh, journey, one that I'd never been on before, as I'm sure many people who know of an autistic individual within their family or in their circles. But I will say he has really opened my eyes. And he also helped me to really slow down, appreciate the simple things in life. And so from that perspective, you know, he's been a wonderful gift. I can't imagine life without him. And I think from this perspective of creating a more inclusive world, you know, I think we all want for our children, for each other, just to live as meaningful, fulfilling lives as possible. And, you know, it's a mindset that I bring into what I do day to day too. Yeah, that's wonderful. The The gift of joy and seeing that joy, um, I'm sure, is, is quite a remarkable thing. 
You have spoken about being overcome with anger, sadness, fear, and despair in the face of the increasing acts of violence and hate against Asian Americans and other underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. What kind of gender or racial bias have you experienced in your own life? You know, I think I have been fortunate in some ways because you know, the bias that I've experienced, you know, has been more subtle over time. I mean, of course, there was a name calling as I was growing up, um, microaggressions from time to time, feeling like opportunity was a little bit harder to come by or the benefit of the doubt wasn't as abundant for me. But I would say in this last couple years now with the rise in anti-Asian American Pacific Islander sentiment, it's been truly upsetting to me. There is no place for racism in our world. I mean, we need to really come together, take advantage of this opportunity to learn about each of our own experiences, to be allies with one another, and to stand together, to stand up for one another, and really try to make for a better future. Yeah, such important words. And I was about to ask you, what advice do you have for us, you know, as we want to stand in solidarity against discrimination and hate? How can the voice of individuals and organizations be even more powerful to help stand up for what's right? I think it starts with reaching out, right, and creating a safe space for these conversations to occur. And, you know, a couple years ago, our company commissioned a study to better understanding racial tensions in the workplace. And what we found is that most of our communities, our networks on a personal basis are not very diverse, but they are in the workplace, in the organizations that we have. And so, you know, creating opportunities to come together, to have candid conversations, honest, difficult conversations about race, I think is the first step. You know, the crescendo of multiple voices speaking up on an issue is really significant. And look to ways, you know, from your colleagues, from your friends and their thoughts on how you can help. I mean, with the Asian community, there's a number of small business owners, local restaurants and businesses. I mean, those are easy ways to try to help, you know, a population of people that, um, you know, have clearly been disadvantaged through this pandemic. So that's where I would say, you know, start. Start with the conversation and understanding. Yeah, thank you for that. I know we'll all um, benefit from that advice. You often say, if I can see it, I can be it. What does that mean? And how does storytelling encourage diversity? And how does it help others on their leadership path? Well, you know, it goes to your question about role models, right? So if you see someone who, you know, looks like you, and positions of leadership or success. And the more you see it, the more you think this is possible for me because I don't need to just fit one mold. There are multiple ways, you know, different shapes, color sizes, um, that there's room for someone like me to be a part of that. And I think for those of us that have the fortune of being able to advance our careers, it's really our opportunity to share our stories along the way. The obstacles are so great, but you get yourself back up. And so, you know, to try to make that road a little bit easier for those that come behind us is where I think the storytelling really makes a difference. You know, um, storytelling is so powerful. I think that people really yearn to learn from our experiences. And one of the experiences that I know you think about a lot is what you do when you're forming teams or friendships. What qualities or values do you look for in those situations? Well, you know, I it's um, it's true in my personal life and my business life. I mean. You know, I've talked about wanting to bring um, a diverse group of people together because I have found, you know, we oftentimes understand a problem better and come to a better solution when we have many different perspectives around the table. So I do look for open-mindedness. I look for, you know, uh, someone who really wants to make a difference and is willing to work hard to achieve it and to bring other people along in the process. When you're getting ready for work in the morning, what's on your mind? What are you thinking about? And what drives you every day? Well, I try each morning to think about the most important things that I should be focused on, that in my role, I'm sort of uniquely positioned to focus. And, um, you know, what motivates me is really making a positive impact. I mean, I, I would say when I was younger, you know, I was more focused on maximizing the opportunity that I had, making the most of it and getting to a place of financial independence. But 
as my career has gone on, I've just been amazed time and time again when we have set out big aspirations, we bring a team of people together, and with incredible intent and hard work, we're able to achieve these things that I sometimes look back and think, wow, that was amazing. And that has fortunately happened to me time and time again. And so that's what gets me up every day. I'm really excited about that opportunity to make a difference. Well, it's clear to me why the individuals who have the honor of working with you are inspired by your vision and by your real purposeful way of bringing people together and building on their unique talents to solve problems or develop the next big strategy. I can feel um, the excitement that your folks must have. I guess my last question for you would be about inspiration. What has been your greatest inspiration? You know, it is the people in my life. Um, I said at the outset, you know, family is very, very important to me. And so, you know, I, I am so proud of my children. I um, really get so much energy and inspiration from the people that I love and that I feel their love. That's wonderful. Um, people, you know, giving, our, giving us the source of our superpower, I think is really great. Are there any final words you'd like to leave with our viewers? Maybe a few thoughts, you know, uh, first is practice kindness. You know, as we all know, we all have challenges and issues in our lives. And so some of which is known, some of which is not. Give people the benefit of the doubt and spread a little kindness. It goes a long way. I would say practice gratitude. You know, for as much as maybe some things don't work out our way, there is so much that does. And so really be thankful for those. And then lastly, believe. Believe in what's possible. Believe that, you know, you can make a difference. Yeah, very powerful. Thank you, Yishin, for being such an inspiring colleague, such an inspiring guest on our show today. We are so grateful to you, and I'll look forward to seeing you real soon. Likewise. Thanks so much, Nancy. Thank you. I really enjoyed my discussion with Yishin to me, she is a leader with purpose. And when you think about how all of her life events have shaped who she is today and how she's learned something along the way from all of the people who have been there for her throughout her life. I love her humbleness and her fact that she focuses on kindness and giving people the benefit of the doubt. That's incredibly wise advice. And most of all, I think her loud and prominent voice on racism and discrimination against Asian Americans and others in this country is very powerful. And her reminder to us that we can all be allies and that we all have a voice in standing up for what is wrong so that we can help the world be a better place. She's an incredible leader, very inspiring, and I would love to hear what you took from that conversation today. Please subscribe comment, and share. I'm Nancy Brown. Thank you for joining in. Next, when at the heart of it with Nancy Brown, living a successful life could be as simple as who you keep in your circle. I recognize that I only know what I know and that there are other people who know far more than what I know. Entrepreneur and social media influencer Malcolm M.J. Harris will help inspire you to get your life on track. Next, at the heart of it.